Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 31, Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle has been the home to 39 British monarchs and has this history stretching back almost a thousand years, all the way back to William the Conqueror. My guest today is Deborah Cadbury. She's the author of the new book, Queen Victoria's Matchmaking, among a host of other history-related accomplishments. We chat about the illustrious history of Windsor Castle, some of the major scenes in British history that took place within its walls, and what it was like for Deborah to do research in its archives, which I imagine would be a dream come true for most of the history fangirls and fanboys out there listening. My guest today is Dr. Deborah Cadbury. She is a Emmy winner. She was nominated for a BAFTA. She worked for the BBC for 30 years. And she is also the author of some amazing works. Uh, Queen Victoria's Matchmaking is the new one we're going to talk about later today. And then also Princes at War, which if you guys like the topic of Windsor Castle and the British royalty, you should definitely check out as well. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on, Deborah. Hello. So we are going to talk today about Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle is the, I believe, the oldest and largest occupied castle in the world. That's right. I went and visited it in uh, 2015. And before I visited, I kind of thought of it more as like an amusement park, (laughs) like that it was just there for show. And then when I got in, I realized, oh my gosh, this is... This is it. Like every famous painting on every British monarchy book is like, it's hanging on the walls. I mean, this is just, it's an amazing place. And so I'm so excited to talk about it. It's quite extraordinary because it's like 13 acres, the the site. It's more like a town. Um, It's a sort of a castle. It's a home, a private home for the Queen, obviously. And also it's this extraordinary slice of a thousand years of British history. It's the most amazing site, really very evocative. And of course, the skyline, you know, as you approach Windsor, that dramatic skyline, especially at night, I mean, I just love it. (laughs) I love, I love it too. So um, I don't think Americans grow up with an understanding of this is what really happened at the tower. This is what really Windsor Castle is. What the difference is between Windsor, Buckingham Palace. Like, we just don't, it's not in our DNA. But when I got there, I was just, I was just completely overwhelmed. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. So how did, so it's the oldest occupied castle. How did it get built? Who, who started this tradition? Well, actually, it goes way back to Saxon times. It was chosen by Saxon kings as a site for a hill fort and royal manor because of its closeness to the river as a key medieval route into London. We're talking, you know, 500, before 1066. Um, But in 1066, you get the Norman invasion, the French invasion of Britain. And that's when William the Conqueror chose the site as one of nine castles that were to form a ring around London, um, a defensive ring to protect his French uh, you know, knights. Um, and it was chosen, obviously, because of these sites, you know, high up above the Thames, just a day's march from the tower, if there was anyone he needed to get rid of, um, and on this fantastic route into London. So um, it started out, really very much in typical design of a Norman Mott and Bailey castle, as they're called, which is quite simply, it sounds very complicated, but it's really simple. It's an earthen mound or mott, as they call it, supporting a tower, which originally was of wood, but eventually stone. And that's the round tower today, right in the heart of the castle. And then uh, that is surrounded by an outer fenced courtyard, or bailey, as they call it. So if you look at Windsor today, you can still see you know, what, what it was like a thousand years ago, because the original mot um, supporting the 
original uh, castle or fort, is now the Round Tower, which I know so well from going into the Royal Archives, which are at the top of the Royal uh, of the Round Tower. And then the um, the baileys or courtyards that they had in Norman times have now become these two really huge courtyards. One's called the Upper Ward, and it has the state apartments and the Queen's private apartments around a sort of quadrangle. And then the even larger one is the Lower Ward, which is the one you approach, you know, when you come by the household guards with the bearskin hats and the red jackets, you know, you're in the Lower Ward. And that's where St George's Chapel is, where Meghan and um, Harry are going to get married later this year. That's so exciting. I I loved Suits back from when the very first season, and I'm I'm I and I love a royal wedding, so I'm very I much looking forward to it. I think everyone's very excited about it here. <laughs> um, so before the castle was built, before the Anglo Saxons started using it, what was it like before? Was it just rural? Yes, it would have just been rural. And it was a, a really famous as a hunting ground. Um, in Windsor Forest, there was very good hunting. And that quite rapidly became royal hunting grounds, um, both in Saxon times and Norman times. And that's really how it came to be a royal residence in the guise of a hunting lodge. William the Conqueror's son, Henry I, stayed there and he loved it built a great hall where he could entertain his courts and barons and they would go out you know shooting in in, in Windsor Forest um, it's now Windsor Great Park um, so really that was the start of it becoming a royal residence that's so interesting because uh, I think people are familiar with like the history of Versailles and it also started out as a hunting lodge there must be something about these places where people connect them with happiness and then they want to build them up <laughs> well hunting was so much part of the you know what they did then in terms of and, and part of the prestige of royalty i mean even in the in the royals that i was studying it is absolutely staggering how they would go out you know shooting deer stalking in balmoral it was a very important part uh, you know right in the 19th century 20th century the monarchs were doing it it's very much associated with royalty now, the archives that are there, what what are they in, and um, are they only open to historians? Yes. You know, you have to make an appointment to see the archives. And um, I first approached the Royal Archives when I was writing about George VI, um, the Queen's father. Um, what I particularly wanted to see were his war diaries. And it was such an experience because, you know, I made this appointment and I was very excited and I was going to go to Windsor. And, you know, you, you, you go right into the, into the heart of the castle, to the round tower. You go up something like 200 stone steps. I can tell you I was so puffed with my heavy computer. And you're looking <laughs> through these slit-like Gothic windows over the home counties, you know, spread eagled below you getting to seem more and more distant. And you go into the Royal Archives and it's another world. What I asked for was George VI's war diaries because he kept a diary all during the war. And it just took me back, straight back to what it must have been like for George VI during the Second World War, um, you know, at Windsor Castle, because he and his family were at night, once the bombing became heavy, Although they were in Buckingham Palace during the day, when Buckingham Palace started to get bombed, they made um, Victoria Tower at Windsor, the family base, and that's where the princesses were. And they slept at the bottom of Victoria Tower. You know, sand, the windows were sandbagged. But there were such evocative scenes, like, um, you know, uh, the day that Coventry was bombed, for example, and the watchmen on the terraces at Windsor, you know, were, were standing on the battlements and they heard an ominous roar, not easily identifiable, but obviously threatening. And it grew nearer and nearer. And, you know, people thought Windsor Castle was going to be obliterated. But it, these bombers just, you know, went straight over the castle um, as though by ghostly command they turned on a northern course went to Coventry and on that particular night, um, we're in um, October 1940, sorry, November 1940, 500 tonnes of high explosive was dropped on Coventry. The city was just completely flattened. And what was amazing to me was 
was the way George VI was keeping his diary during all of this. So things like Dunkirk just absolutely came alive because if you can picture him, uh, you know, at Windsor Castle when the British army was surrounded in France um, and nobody believed they could rescue the British army and all those European countries in a great, great sweep had fallen like nine pens to um, Hitler's blitzkrieg and the king was just writing in complete despair in his diary, I'm so dreadfully sorry for these men, that's the British army, uh, nearly 300,000 men, as I do not see how any but a small percentage can get out. This is George VI writing his diary on the 29th of May. Oh, wow. And, you know, you can see how his mood changes because uh, the word went out, Every able man and boy wanted to be part of it, to find a vessel that would float and bring a soldier back to England. They had no doubt, you know, they were going to bring the boys back home. And the King's Diary shows just how bit closely he was bound up in each stage. He kept a record each night of the numbers of, of men who had been saved. And, you know, suddenly you're right there in Britain's finest hour through the eyes of royalty. So, you know, I found it very moving to be able to sit there and read the diaries in the castle, knowing this is where he had written some of these sort of absolutely stirring scenes that dramatically affected British history. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's not like the most important scenes in British history happened in Windsor Castle, but so many of the important decisions and yes. events in the, especially when it comes to things related to the royalty, what are some other events that happened there? Well, if we go back in time, and I must admit, I do tend to see it slightly with the dramatist side because I'm writing, you know, you're, you're writing the scenes to try to bring this history alive for people. But if we go back to his brother, for example, Edward VIII, um, you know, there were such wonderful accounts of the day that he abdicated because of the American Wallace Simpson. And, you know, he walked across the courtyard at Windsor Castle, which was absolutely dark and quiet. Um, now an ex-king, because he's, he's signed the abdication papers. We're only four years earlier, in 1936, December 1936, and all the dramatic events of the abdication have happened. And technicians from the BBC were waiting in the Augusta Tower for him. And that was when he did his famous broadcast, where he made his way you know, up the ancient stone staircase to the top of the Augusta Tower, to the waiting microphone, and, you know, started to broadcast to the nation. Um, I found it impossible to carry out the heavy burden of responsibility and discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. Well, there he is making his declaration for Wallace right in the heart of Windsor Castle. And then, of course, you know, if you go further back into the 1800s, and for me, it's so real. It's like this was a living family that was, you know, living and breathing in these walls because there is a thousand years of royal family history in, in Windsor Castle. And, uh, you know, there are amazing scenes for Queen Victoria, like, for example, the day when she first sees Prince Albert. And uh, it was the 10th of October, 1839. And because she's little, and you may have seen that lovely Victoria series. I didn't, but I, uh, young, young Victoria, the one that um, Emily Blunt oh. stars in is my, one of my favorite movies of all time. I got oh, it. Okay. Yeah, no, it's beautiful, that one. Well, I mean, if you can picture her, you know, in, I think that movie did have the scene. She stands, because she's little, she wants to have a vantage point, and she doesn't want to appear at a disadvantage, and she stands on top of the broad stairs in the upper court. As Albert starts to arrive, it's like she's struck with lightning. You know, she was just instantly in love. She said, you know, it was with some emotion that I beheld Albert, who is beautiful, and later in her diary, you know, it's quite clear she's absolutely, you know, turned on by Prince Albert. And within five days, she proposes to him. And that also happens at Windsor Castle. Uh, you know, so there's such lovely scenes there. Um, but of course, later on in her life, uh, in 1861, it is also the place where Albert, uh, and it was sudden, um, and, you know, as she breathed his last, it's said that she let out one great long wild shriek, you know, 
know, she could hardly cope with what was happening. And it was at this terror-stricken cry when all across the, the palace, the, the great castle, you know, echoing, reverberating around those walls, you know, she she really wanted to die too at that moment. And, and all her records show just how desolate she was when she was passing from Albert. So, you know, wonderful, vivid scenes during her era. Shall I go further back? Yeah, I, I'm sorry if I'm not asking a lot of questions. I'm just mesmerized. So. <laughs> okay, but I'm going, I seem to be going backwards in history. If we now go the other way, I left at William the Conqueror and he built a wooden, he built a wooden castle. And his great grandson, Henry II, about 100 years later, we're about 1170, um, started to turn the wooden structure into a stone structure. And that was when the castle started to look like um, what it is today. The round tower was actually the first thing to be turned into stone from the wooden structure. Um, and um, I mean, there are some wonderful events. I could just pick out a couple um, over the course of history. One that I obviously like very much is the signing of the Magna Carta in 1215 between King John then his barons at Runnymede, which is very close by, um, between Old Windsor and the meadow of Runnymede, oh, with wow. the forming a very dramatic backdrop. And Windsor Castle uses the base for all the important meetings of the king and the barons during the negotiations of this charter. And of course, this charter is terribly important in British history because it was the first attempt to limit the absolute power of kings. Um, you know, to demand, the barons were demanding protection of church rights, protection from illegal imprisonment, limitations on feudal payments. The king just couldn't demand what he liked. Um, so, you know, that is for me, you know, if, you, if we imagine going all the way back to the 1200s, the idea that people were just beginning to put limits on the king's absolute power and this divine right of kings, which was established, you know, worldwide. The Tudors did very little to the castle. Henry VIII was buried there. Henry VIII of the six wives was buried there um, and um, he did actually build a new gateway to the lower ward but the Tudors overall did very little. But there are dramatic changes during the British Civil War in the 17th century. Um, that was really a watershed in Windsor history and the castle amazingly only just survived because once um, the parliamentarians executed Charles I, Oliver Cromwell came to power as Lord Protector in 1653. And his parliamentarians seized the castle, a royalist stronghold, and all the royal apartments were sacked. Um, it became a prison for royalists. The great park was divided up. And the thing that amazed me was that there was a bill in Parliament to demolish Windsor because it's a symbol um, of royalist power and strength. And this bill was defeated by just one vote. Oh, wow. So, I know. <laughs> so, you know, we have Windsor today by virtue of whoever it was that decided to vote that way. You know, thank you very much. They should erect a statue to that person in the <laughs> courtyard. Yes, well, I rather like that story. But then, then what you see really... Um, uh, in the Restoration, Charles II, um, you know, set out to revive uh, all the royalist grandeur. He came to the throne in 1660, after Cromwell had fallen, and he wanted to rival the achievements of the Sun King, Louis XIV at Versailles, and reinstate the old glories of the crown and find his father's treasures that had been sacked from the castle. And he set about creating the grandest state apartments in England. Um, and that laid the basis for the state apartments that, you know, anyone can go in and see today. Um, turning the upper ward part of the castle into effectively a splendid Baroque palace. Um, you know, really beautiful, a whole series of fabulous rooms. And then its next big transformation was in the 1820s when George IV came to the throne. 
And this was in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. And what he wanted to do was create a palace that was suitable for a monarch of the richest and most powerful nation in the world. I mean, he was really going to make his stamp. This was going to say Britain is the best. And he spent, believe it or not, a million pounds on Windsor in those days. I dread to think what that would be now. Which included closing terraces that were open to the public, raising the round tower 30 feet, adding the magnificent grand corridor to the, to the main quadrangle. Um, and he was a great fan of Frank Fire. And he really put a fresh touch to the state apartments and created the semi-state rooms. And really, most of the rooms that you see today are there because of um, what George IV did in the 1820s. Um, after that, it's been updating, but you know the lavishness, the pomp, the splendor is what you see from those times. Okay. And that actually, so having, I've toured Versailles and I've toured, I've obviously toured Windsor and then touring, um, uh, Sicilian Hof in, uh, Potsdam, which is another, uh, you really can feel just the overwhelm, even like the details in the wallpaper are yeah. and just, I mean, like there's no corner of any of these places that doesn't scream. Like we are very wealthy and important. <laughs> That's so right. I mean, the rooms are just magnificent. You know, the State Departments have got some of the finest works of art from the Royal Collections. You know, famous works by Rembrandt, Van Dyck, Rubens. Um, unbelievably ornate um, marquetry, gilding, um, ceiling carvings, um, statues, um, exquisite French furniture. And of course, it's all there in its suite after suite after suite of rooms. Um, but my favourites are actually the semi-state rooms, rooms like the Crimson Drawing Room and the White's Drawing Room. I think they're just stunning. So are there any other architectural spots that uh, listeners should make sure to be aware of, especially if they decide to go there? Well, I mean, what's very popular with people is the Doll's House that was built. Oh, yes. <laughs> built Queen Mary in the, in the 1920s. It's just so cute, and children love it. It's huge for a start. It's in a room on its own, on a six-foot table. It's done on a one to 12 scale, one inch for a foot. Um, and, you know, it's just so beautifully, exquisitely done. Even, you know, the books in the library in this little doll's house were written by the great writers of the day for the doll's house. So, you know, it's got beautiful things. Um, a fully stocked wine cellar, a garden, um, <laughs> electricity, running hot and cold water, working lifts, flushing lavatories. I mean, it's sort of unbelievable. <laughs> did um, did Queen or did uh, Princess Mary play with it? I'm sure they did. Well, I, to be honest, I don't know. Maybe it was regarded as just too much of a treasure from the beginning. <laughs> because yeah. it's it's one of those things where I loved my dollhouse growing up. But and I played I mean I played in my dollhouse a lot, but I can't imagine it's so it's so big, I can't even imagine being like six or eight and trying to play in it. It's yeah. it's like yeah. a it's the size it's almost the size of a real house. It's just every, yeah. it's just a, it's it's stunning. Yeah. Well of course the other place that people might want to know about is St. George's Chapel, where Meghan and Harry are going to get married. Mm. And this is I mean it's called a chapel. But frankly, you know, it's cathedral-like in its scale. It's in the lower ward, and it is regarded as an absolute masterpiece of what's called perpendicular Gothic. Um, and it is um, medieval in its origins, uh, begun in the 14th century, but massively expanded in the 15th. You know, an absolute glory of the medieval era with um, lavishly wood-carved choir stalls, and all the beautiful and, you know, just a great riot of colour, the crests and heraldic banners of the members of the Order of the Garter that hang above the choir stalls. I mean, it's a very spectacular and very stately um, setting for this wedding, which I think will be rather lovely. Why did they pick St. George's Chapel? Well, um, it is actually the place where, um, you know, many of the... Um, uh, weddings and um, I mean it is the place that is used by the royal family for many of these ceremonies 
Um, when it comes to funerals, ten kings are buried buried there. So let's talk specifically about Windsor during Queen Victoria's era. I know we talked about it a little bit. Because of your book, you are a specialist now in her matchmaking schemes. And yeah. we'll talk more about the book uh, later. But were, were any of the schemes hatched specifically in Windsor? Or does she talk about or do you have any documentation on any of these scenes happening there? <laughs> um, well, uh, let me think. Um, now, she was matchmaking all the time. So I <laughs> I think we can be pretty certain that some of these plots were hatching at Windsor. There's a wonderful image drawn of what it was like from the point of view of her grandchildren. Um, This is actually from her granddaughter who became the Queen of Romania. And she says, and I'm quoting her, this is from her diary, her biography, her autobiography. She says, silent soft carpeted corridors led to grandmama's apartments which was somehow always approached from afar off. Um, One door after another opened noiselessly. It was like passing through the hall courts of a temple before approaching the final mystery to which only the initiated had access. And when you opened the final door, what was amazing to her was that you opened the door and you were expecting, you know, someone immensely powerful behind. But behind was a small, unimposing little woman Um, who somehow knew extraordinarily well how to inspire reverential fear, Um, but not a bit frightening, smiling a kind of smile, almost as shy as us children, so the conversation wasn't fluent on either side. And her room smelt deliciously of orange flowers, even when there were no orange flowers about, and images of grandpapa everywhere. Well, you know, this was probably written in about the 1880s, I should think, um, when she was elderly, and of course she had changed by then, because when Albert and Victoria originally started on their matchmaking mission, they had actually a very um, coherent plan. It was part of a wider European story, and it had a very specific purpose, because after the Napoleonic Wars, when six million people had died and Europe had been devastated, Prince Albert saw a greater role for the dynasty through the marital alliances of the children to bring peace and stability. And he quite literally saw it that each marriage of their children was a form of soft power to help spread British liberal values across the continent and a sort of pushback against the destabilizing forces of republicanism, revolution and war. And she had a, he had a vision, they both did, they shared it, of a sort of federal Europe, um, strong with a series of independent countries, stable under their own constitutional monarchies, where, you know, the kings and queens were all closely related, so they would never go to war. <laughs> now, that's a little bit different vision than, like, I'm thinking of, like, uh, Marie Antoinette being sent to France to keep the Austro-French alliance. This is... It's more than alliances, which I think is normally what the tradition had been, right? Yes, it is, because it's, you're absolutely right there. It's not just a question of building alliances, although that was a key part of it, especially they wanted a German. They foresaw that Germany would be unified and become the leading power on the continent. And they wanted a union between Britain and Germany to help keep the peace. Um, but it was also more than that, because it was to spread what they saw as enlightened liberal values uh, moved towards the way the British Parliament was, um, you know, the British Parliament was the envy of the world, really, in terms of the stability and the wealth and strength that it created. And the idea was literally to try to transplant the British model across Europe. So, yes, it had a very, um, uh, you know, far-reaching consequences as part of the vision. Because, you know, you have to cast your mind back, this was a time when Russia was ruled by the Romanovs as an autocracy. And we're talking about one-sixth of the surface of the globe. Um, Germany, just recently unified, um, was also a semi-autocracy under a German emperor and uh, the, the leading power in Europe. And Britain... Um, you know, dominating a quarter of the surface of the globe. So these marriages really mattered when you're talking about, you know, 
when, when it's the Emperor of Russia that's calling Queen Victoria Granny, and it's the Emperor of um, uh, Germany who is her oldest grandson, um, you know, it's extraordinary to cast your mind back to a time when the royal family wielded, and, and really the British royal family, wielded this extraordinary power and influence. And it was all of that that they were seeking to, um, you know, to build and shape the political landscape of Europe. And that's what I was trying to write about in my book. And what I found amazing was the way actually all the best intentions turned into the exact opposite and led us into the First World War. And it gives you a completely different perspective on how we led into the First World War. And that was really what I was writing about. What do you think was her most successful match in terms of the relationship between the two people? Well, interestingly, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's fascinating how this was navigated. You know, some of the matches were very successful in terms of, 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 of love. Um, you know, if we go to her oldest daughter, and this was absolutely a political marriage, um, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's oldest daughter, I'll call her Vicky, she was actually Victoria, but I'll call her Vicky in order not to confuse things. And she was lined up to marry the Prussian heir um, because they could see that um, Germany was going to unify and they thought that it should unify, um, it was likely to unify under Prussia, and therefore she was likely to end up more or less with her husband ruling this country. And, you know, Albert is warning her at the time of the marriage, the future of not just of, of your happiness is at stake, but of your country, people, and their power, by one might say, the welfare of Europe. But actually, she was completely in love with Prince Frederick, her husband. He was like some Wagnerian hero in her eyes. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a loving marriage. Another one that was also very loving, I mean, almost too loving, actually, that this was not a set-up marriage. This was a marriage which Queen Victoria opposed to the bottom of her heart. She almost had premonitions about it. It's the marriage of her favourite granddaughter, um, Princess Alex of Hesse, uh, to the Tsarevich, Nicholas. Um, they obviously became the last Tsar and Tsarina. Um, and actually, this marriage is a really interesting one because the Queen fought it all away. She had decided that Russia was not a safe place for one of her granddaughters. She came to the conclusion that Russian autocracy was just not stable. And that as we move towards the modern world, uh, you know, it was so clear that there had to be change. There was such an impulse for change, um, such a great momentum building up for change. Um, you know, the idea that one family ends up ruling as an autocrat with so-called divine power just seemed to her it was not going to last. And, pol and political um, terrorism was absolutely rife in Russia. Um, there was a horrific incident which really, you know, troubled her when um, actually the last Tsar, Nicholas's grandfather, Tsar Alexander II in 1881, um, was murdered. Actually, this is a scene which takes us straight back to Windsor, because again, I was amazed. There was a file on the murder of Alexander II in 1881. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, it was so amazing. Again, you're just taken straight back to this feeling of the Queen there, as all these telegrams come in from St. Petersburg one afternoon in March in 1881. And she writes in her diary of her absolute ineffable horror at what she's reading, because what's actually happening on that day is the birth of a modern form of political terrorism. Because what had happened was a, new, a totally new terrorist organization had formed called the People's Will in Russia. And what they set out to do was called propaganda of the deed. And that is assassination as propaganda. And that was really the first time that had been done on scale. And they had stalked the Tsar through six assassination attempts before they finally got him. He felt like a hunted hare, hunted man. And, you know, each one of those was, was awful in his own right in terms of what happened. But this final one where they threw dynamite at his carriage, um, dynamite had only recently been invented. And, you know, you could steal it from quarries. 
because it was being used to create all the railways and the cuttings and the sidings and you know you'd find it at work sites and that's how the terrorists were getting it and they threw the dynamite at his carriage and I'm afraid he died the most awful and frightening death and uh, you know this was a very key part of why Queen Victoria thought her grandchildren not going to go to Russia <laughs> so she absolutely opposed it was almost with the strength of a premonition she felt that Russia was not a safe place. And of course, after her death, when, you know, centuries of, of, of the wrongs of Romanov rule was visited on the last Tsar and Tsarina, and the sheer torment they went through um, with their young family, you know, these beautiful um, grand duchesses and the uh, Tsarevich and um, you know, it, it, it was quite a a hell of a, well, I mean, it's cast a shadow over the 20th century, what happened to her family. So the Queen's right about that. How did she react when Alex did it anyway? With horror. I mean, she, she wrote in her diary, she was quite thunderstruck because she thought she worked very, very hard at persuading, trying to persuade her granddaughters out of Russian marriages. Before Alex, her older sister, Ella, uh, wanted to marry a grand duke, a czar, uh, the Tsar's brother, the previous Tsar, uh, Alexander III. And, uh, you know, there are these amazing stories where she invites Elizabeth of Hellas, Ella, um, to Windsor and to Balmoral, and really works on her granddaughter to break off her engagement, um, which she did. She broke off her engagement to Grand Duke Sir Guy. Um, only as soon as she had left the clutches of the Queen, <laughs> <laughs> home and met Sergei again to feel no he was the right one and she went to Russia and actually she played a very key part in persuading her younger sister to join her and overcoming her younger sister's fears of going to Russia and you know that's an amazing story that I'm writing about now. One of the things that I really like about uh, your book and the topic of it is I feel like so often the, the political decisions and the um, family decisions that women make, even women rulers, aren't given the same weight and consequence as uh, decisions made by their male counterparts. How did you decide to write a book that was completely about politics through the actions of uh, a female monarch That's, uh, with the decisions of her granddaughters being so central? It's just so interesting to me. Well, I'd always known that you know, seven of her grandchildren ended up on Europe's thrones at a critical time in history in the First World, in the First World War. And that seemed to me to be astonishing power for one family. Um, and what I wanted to know was how, how had this come about? Um, and that led me to look at her role as a matchmaker. Um, and of course, you know, the more you look at it, the more interesting it is because it's sort of granny power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I and mean, we were talking about soft power earlier, um, but there she is. You know, she hasn't got real political power by the end of the 19th century. She is not like the Russian Tsar, who can dictate laws, decide divorces, decide who goes to prison. You know, I mean, absolutely any decision, any appointment can come down to the Tsar. She was actually not like that. There were real strict limits on her power. And she didn't actually even have the power of the German emperor, who was effectively semi-autocratic. The parliament um, was almost a fig leaf, because although its representatives were elected, they had no real power um, to make laws. Um, but, you know, the British parliament did. And that meant that Queen Victoria didn't have real political power. Um, she could advise, but... That was the limit of her power. But in this one function as granny, through her um, relatives, she could effectively shape the political landscape of Europe. And she realized that. And it was exploring that granny power, which, as you say, male historians have not looked at it. But it was a very, very interesting topic to explore, to see how she took her decisions and how she changed across the generations and what the impact of all of this actually was. What are you working on now? Well, right now I'm actually working on several things that follow on from that um, because there are wonderful dramatic possibilities for um, 
uh, the Russian story, which I'm looking into. Uh, I just love them. I just completely love the Russian story. It's so exciting and so dramatic. Yeah, I, I um, have not been to Russia yet. I'm hoping to get to St. Petersburg soon-ish. Um, oh, you do the Winter Palace in your series. I'm so excited because I actually studied uh, – Russian, not Russian history, but I was an Eastern, Russian and Eastern European studies major for a while before I couldn't actually learn enough Russian to finish the degree. But I fell in love with all the stories and the literature from St. Petersburg. So I can't, I really can't wait to see it. So uh, as soon as whatever you're working on comes out, I'm going to gobble it up. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So should, let's go back to Windsor for just a moment. What is it like to visit today as a visitor if you don't have your special archives access? Oh, well, I mean, what children love to do is stand by the um, by the Queen's Guards, by the Household Guards. It's always great fun to see the guards parading about. Um, there's the State Apartments to see. There's the Doll's House. There's just the sheer ambiance as you walk in through the um, lower or the upper wards and just see around. Um, and, of course, the Queen is still using the palace today. You know, it is her private home where she usually spends the weekend. Um, as well as taking out formal duties. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, the, it, it's sort of a living palace, as it were. Yes, and unlike, so if you visit the White House in D.C., you have to get very special permission weeks in advance, and you have to get cleared by the uh, Secret Service before you go, and it's kind of a process. But here, even though they do live there, I think anyone can go and buy tickets. So if you are in the area, you should definitely go. And it's it's out in the home counties. It's not quite in London, but it is a good day trip from London if you're based in London. Very easy to get to by train from central London. Um, which brings you into Old Windsor. And then it's the most beautiful walk up the hill to the castle, a a short walk. Excellent. Well, um, Deborah, thank you so much. Listeners who are interested in learning more, you guys should definitely check out Queen Victoria's Matchmaking, The Royal Marriages That Shaped Europe. And uh, once you finish your recipe, you should come back and tell us all about St. Petersburg. Well, I'd like to hear about your trip around Winter Palace. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say thank you again to Deborah for coming on the show. If you're curious to learn more about what it would be like to have Queen Victoria as your grandmother or her relationship with her grandchildren, please check out Queen Victoria's Matchmaking. It's a really great read. I highly recommend it. Housekeeping. This episode comes out on the day that I start the Camino de Santiago, which is the historic pilgrim's trail in Spain. My plan is to do the last 100 kilometers from Soraya to Santiago de Compostela. If you want to follow me along on my journey, you can go to my Instagram and Facebook page. I will have Instagram stories and live Facebook videos from the road. Find me on either platform or both. I am History Fangirl on both of those. And then as far as the website goes, I have been trying to post more articles on the website. I recently posted a roundup of gorgeous Catholic monasteries in Europe and South America that you can visit, or if you don't plan on visiting, you can at least learn about them and dream about them. They're beautiful. There's a link in the show notes if you want to check that out and go ahead and check out the website. And then finally, if you haven't left a review of the show in the podcast app of your choice today, it would be a great day to do so. Think about how wonderful it would be for me when I'm done with my Camino and I open up the internet and see some shiny new reviews. Um, That would totally make my day and I would appreciate it immensely. Thank you so much for listening.